From our State House studio in Montgomery, I'm Todd Stacy. Welcome to Capital Journal. Alabama has hit a new record low for unemployment. Governor Kay Ivey has announced that the state's jobless rate for April was 2.8%, down from 2.9% in March, and down from 3.6% this time last year. Wages are also up more than $21 a week from last year. Alabama's public K-12 schools have received more than $3 billion in federal COVID relief funds since 2020. Now, a new website is tracking how each school system will spend that money. The a Education Partnership this week launched the Detailed Money Tracker, where anyone could easily sort through how all the school systems in the state are spending relief money. The site also contains an advocate toolkit with recommendations for how school districts can spend funds more effectively. You can access the site at aplusala.com. A national shortage of baby formula continued this week. State Health Officer Dr. Scott Harris is advising parents in need of formula to talk to their pediatrician about potential alternatives. There are certainly people that are having trouble finding the product they're used to finding. I, I don't uh, think most people are unable to find anything. I think there is additional product out there, and the best advice is to talk to your, you know, pediatrician or healthcare provider about what's right for your child. Um, in, in Alabama, um, our women's, infants, and children's program that provides nutrition for low-income people uh, has a contract with uh, Mead Johnson, which is not the uh, factory that shut down. That was an Abbott factory. Some states are actually Abbott states, and, and others are, you know, with others like other companies like Alabama. Those states that contract with Abbott really are seeing big shortages in their WIC programs as well. Um, but we're not seeing that in our WIC program. But also, you know, most. Uh, uh, people who are buying formula aren't in our WIC program. They're, you know, people who are out in, in the private world trying to track down formula. So the most important thing to do is, is talk to your pediatrician or healthcare provider. Please don't try to make your own formula. Please don't water down formula that you have to make it last longer. Uh, please don't buy, buy things on the black market if you don't know where they're coming from. Uh, just talk to your doctor and try to figure out the best way to take care of your baby. My full interview with Dr. Harris later in the show. The legislature in recent years has passed laws aimed at improving Alabama's lagging math and reading scores, especially in lower grades. Capital Journal's Karen Goldsmith visited kindergarten classrooms to see how these laws are being implemented. It's the end of the school year, but at Thelma Smiley Morris Elementary School, the zeal for teaching is five greater than five. You thumbs up or thumbs down? Thumbs down. Thumbs down and the zeal for learning. January, February, March, and April, May, June has not faded. How many days of the week? Seven! And they are Saturday, Monday! Their principal says developing this enthusiasm is vital to learning, especially in kindergarten. In kindergarten, children start to have a love for, for school, but just creating that, that atmosphere where they enjoy coming to school and just love being around their teacher and just love learning. Creating this love for learning early is even more critical because the Alabama Literacy Act says students not reading on grade level by third grade will have to repeat third grade. My data is showing that um, at least 90% are my kindergartners who are going to first grade are readers. Jan can hop on a cue. They can make a joke. You did not win the game. It did not go quick. I started out at the high school with math and they couldn't read at all. So once I started researching, the best grade to learn how to read is kindergarten. And this kindergarten teacher's class has one of the school's highest grade point averages. I, I don't take days off, so I'm coming in, they see me every day, and we're doing the same thing over and over, and as they progress, I'm making it harder and harder. Shanice Bird shares how her students successfully hit their math targets. They love to be engaged. They love to get up out their seats. They love to show you what they know. I can. I can. Count to 100. Count to 100. By 10. By 10. She also uses a special positive reinforcement tool. Mwah. 
kiss your brain, kissing their brain makes them feel like they accomplished what they were looking for. It just encourages them. It just, they know that they got the answer correct. So they're excited like, yes, I did it. And how are these students celebrating the end of their first year of big kids school? In the same way the big kids celebrate the end of their K through 12 academic career with a graduation. For Capital Journal, I'm Karen Goldsmith. It's no secret that gas prices are at record highs. As Capital Journal's Randy Scott reports, most everyone is feeling that pain at the pump. It's that time of the year. Try to relax from work, but... Get ready to pay for your relief while getting a full tank of gas. These high gas prices are a problem for a lot of people, not just traveling for vacation, but on a day-to-day -day basis because the cost of everything the last year or so has gone up significantly. Uh, cars, housing, groceries, uh, you name it, it's gone up quite a bit. It seems like everything except our paychecks have gone up. Keeping a close eye on rising gas prices is Triple A of Alabama. Clay Ingram is spokesperson for the agency. For Alabama, for example, this week we've set a new record high every day this week. And uh, you know we're still a little, a little ways away from Memorial Day, which is one of our highest demand points of the year, which means it's usually one of our highest price points of the year. So I, I think uh, we're likely to see prices get higher before they start to come back down. For the first time, the average price of a gallon of gasoline has hit the $4 mark in all 50 states. Not the news consumers want to hear with the start of summer and travel season a few days away. Experts watching this trend say consumers are having to make choices in regards to spending when it comes to items such as food, utilities, and gasoline. Ingram says consumers can help themselves by conserving gas. Another tip, shop around for low gas prices. If we price shop when we do buy gas, that generates some competition in the marketplace out there and these stations will have to start competing for our business by lowering their prices and that puts downward pressure on our gas prices as well. Ingram says pain at the pump will test people's nerves but it's not permanent. It may be a little while before they go back down but uh, they will go back down at some point. For Capital Journal, I'm Randy Scott. Alabama's primary elections are upon us. The Republican and Democratic primaries will take place Tuesday. This year, Alabama is attempting to secure the integrity of the vote by using state-supplied computers in all counties to exclusively report and transmit election results. Secretary of State John Merrill said he doesn't expect reporting delays. He said people can expect unofficial results to be reported on the Secretary of State's website as usual. Because of some of the concerns that have been introduced nationally, and we've never had a vulnerability exposed in Alabama, but we want to make sure that each one of our 68 probate judges in the 67 counties are actually using a secured hard drive that will transmit the data to us that has never been used for any other purpose except for election night reporting. So we spent 247000 taxpayer dollars to make sure that those purchases were made and that those computers are placed in the 67 counties in the 68 jurisdictions. So there's no excuse not to use a secured technical expert piece of equipment for that purpose. My full interview with Secretary Merrill later in the show. It may not be a presidential year, but midterm elections are when the range of Alabama's constitutional and legislative offices are on the ballot. Plus, this year, we have a major race for the U.S. Senate to replace the retiring Richard Shelby. Let's start there and go down the ballot with what you can expect to see at the polls on Tuesday. First, on the Democratic side, we have Will Boyd, Brandon Dean, and Lanny Jackson running for their party's nomination to the U.S. Senate. Then, on the Republican side, the race that has gotten so much attention, Katie Britt, Mo Brooks, Mike Durant in a, top, in a tight race at the top, but also on the ballot are Lily Bodie, Carla Dupriest, and Jake Schaefer. Remember, if no candidate wins more than 50% of the vote, the race goes to a, a runoff election. Moving on to the governor's race, first on the Democratic side, a crowded field. Yolanda Flowers, Patricia Jamison, Arthur Kennedy, Chad Chig Martin, Malika Sanders Fortier, and Doug Newblue Smith. On the Republican side, Governor Kay Ivey is vying for re-election, but facing some competition. 
uh, again, a crowded field. Tim James, Lindy Blanchard, Lou Burdett, Stacy Lee George, Dean Young, Dave Thomas, and Dean Odell. Attorney General Steve Marshall is also seeking re-election. He's facing Harry Still III in the Republican primary. That winner will face Democrat Wendell Major, who is unopposed. For Supreme Court, a two-way race between Republicans Greg Cook and Deborah Jones. This is for place five on the court. The winner will face Democrat Anita Kelly, who is unopposed. For, for Secretary of State, a four-man race on the Republican side. Wes Allen, Christian Horn, Ed Packard, and Jim Ziegler all vying for that position. The winner will face Democrat Pamela Lafitte in November. For State Auditor, we have Republicans Stan Cook, Rusty Glover, and Andrew Sorrell. There is no Democrat running, so the winner here gets the job. There are two Public Service Commission seats on the ballot this year. We'll start with place one, where incumbent Jeremy Oden is facing John Hammock, Stephen McClam, and Brent Woodall. For place two on the PSC, incumbent Chip Beaker is facing a challenge from Robin Litaker, Robert McCollum. No Democrats are seeking either seat on the Public Service Commission. And that's the ballot, save for the local races and initiatives you'll see based on where you live. We encourage you to exercise your right to vote and go to the polls on Election Day. We'll be right back. You can watch past episodes of Capital Journal online at video.aptv.org. Capital Journal episodes are also available on APTV's free mobile app. You can also connect with Capital Journal and link to past episodes on Capital Journal's Facebook page. And you can listen to past episodes of Capital Journal when you're driving or on the go with Capital Journal Podcasts. Next, I'm joined by Senator Greg Reed of Jasper, President Pro Tem of the Alabama Senate. Senator, thanks for coming on Capital Journal. Thank you, Todd. Always good to be with you, friend. Well, you know, you and I didn't really get to catch up at the very end of the session. I mean, it went to midnight and everybody was pretty eager to get home. True. But it's been a little while, but I wanted to ask you just your general thoughts about this past legislative session, how its productivity, its effectiveness, what, what kind of grade would you give the legislature? I think we have a, a high mark. I, I feel great about the accomplishments. In the beginning of the session, you had a lot of questions from folks within the legislature as well as the media and the general public. Hey, what can you get done? It's an election year. There's a lot of you know pushing and pulling. And certainly that's a part of the process and we all recognize that. But we tried to categorize things into some packages that we felt like were very important to the people of Alabama. And we were very successful with that. We had $160 million in tax cuts in a tax cut package that affect uh, families, retirees, businesses. Uh, we had a Second Amendment package where we had a couple of very significant Second Amendment legislative items. Uh, we worked on a broadband package. We had a farmer's package to support agriculture. Um, so several of those things were, were items that took us the entire session, like military bills. We had a number of those. Election security, those kinds of things. We worked on those throughout the entire session. But when we got to the end, we had accomplished what we said we were going to do related to those packages in the beginning. And if you add to that the extraordinary budgets that we had, Alabama's economy continuing to be very robust. So we had very strong um, education budget, very strong general fund budget. We were able to pay back a lot of debt, um, make some very wise long-term decisions for some extra money that we had. Plus we were able to give raises to state employees and school teachers and do some other things that were very important uh, to the people of Alabama. I felt great about the session. Was there anything that got lost on the cutting room floor that, that didn't get done that you maybe wanted to see done? You know, there were, some, there were some items that were important to individual members. One of the things you and I talked about before, because in this quadrennium, we had one whole session that we lost because of the virus, where we were only here for about a week. Um, there were some things that were individual items that were important to a number of members that they pushed hard in the last session. They weren't able to get them finished. I think that they'll come back with those, you know, as we move into another quadrennium. But as far as large, ticket items, items that were very important. Now we spent some time working on gaming, that didn't pass. Um, you know, we spent a lot of time working on prisons, that did pass. 
Uh, so some, some huge items that had been around for a long, long time, we dealt with them, had some accomplishment, but there'll still be some, some issues that, of course, uh, we move into a, a new quadrennium. There'll be plenty of new things for us to work on. Sure, sure thing. Um, ARPA, the legislature dealt with the first round of these funds, American Rescue Plan Act funds, um, but there's a second round coming pretty soon, actually. This, they're, they're saying this summer um, some $1.1 billion dollars in the second round. Um, what do you foresee being the priorities in terms of spending that money? I think it's real important as we look at what we did with ARPA to be happy about those resources and the way they were allocated. Um, but we need to recognize as we move to ARPA II, some of the requirements from the Department of Treasury at the federal level are going to be different. For instance, in ARPA I, we had a large amount of money that was categorized by the Treasury as lost revenues. So basically it was revenues identified that would have come to the state to be allocated by the legislature that we did not get because of coronavirus and the effects. And as a result, we were able to allocate those pretty much the way we felt like was best. Those numbers are going to be less. That revenue loss number is going to be much less in this $1.1 billion. So there will be a lot more restrictions from the federal government on what we can do with these resources. So we've got to keep that in mind on the front end because, of course, if we spend these resources in the incorrect way outside of the regulatory requirements, then the state's responsible to pay them back. So we've got to make sure that we do it in the right way. Several items that I think will continue to be of significance. Broadband, internet access, which is one of the top issues for Alabama's economy, our children's education, health care, that will continue to be a top item. Uh, hospitals, nursing homes, obviously they're on the front line with dealing with coronavirus, some of the reimbursements that are required, the expense of nursing and nursing care, which is a big deal. Um, that'll have to be an issue. We looked at water and sewer projects, which were very popular with members of the legislature because these are long-term institutional infrastructure issues that are very expensive many times, but that yield benefits for communities for 30, 40, 50 years into the future. Uh, we spent $225 million in the last round on one for those projects. I think in ARPA 2 you will see that again as more of those resources added to that infrastructure. And we're looking for other ideas and other thoughts that are going to be important ways to use the money within the guidelines of what the Department of Treasury is going to tell us. My attitude all along with this has been how can we spend these dollars in a way that will pay dividends for the people of Alabama decades into the future. Those are the kinds of projects that we're looking for. Not just spend the money to make somebody happy that they got an increase in their budget or something like that. Those are important. We deal with that in the budget process. These are resources that can be allocated in ways that accomplish goals that we otherwise may not have an opportunity to accomplish that are beneficial for a long time into the future, and that's what we're going to be focused on. There's talk of a special session to specifically focus on these funds. Have you had any conversations with Governor Ivey about the timing of something like that? We've had some discussion about this. I think we're waiting on the Department of the Treasury to give us the details, certainly waiting on the specifics of exactly when the funds themselves will be available to us. Uh, or if they are already in the state, when can we expend them? So I think there's still some more clarity that will come. Obviously, the governor of Alabama makes the decision on when we're going to have special sessions, but the uh, legislative leadership will continue to be involved. But there will need to be more discussion about that and trying to understand what the timing may be. Obviously, our goal is to get these resources to the people of Alabama as quickly as we can. At the same time, do it in a way to where we know what we're doing definitively before we launch into a project like a special session to be able to get it done. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you about the issue of abortion. You know, we all saw the leaked opinion from the Supreme Court. Um, that makes it possible, if not likely, that the Supreme Court is poised to overturn Roe v. Wade. Um, the effect of that would essentially send the question of regulation of abortion to, to the states. Alabama has obviously passed multiple laws uh, restricting abortion, including 2019, what amounts to one of, if not the strictest law in the country, um, a, a near total ban, no exceptions. Um, 
that of course has been enjoined by the court. But if this if if this, the court overturns Roe, it could go into effect, which is interesting because I talked to Terry Collins, the sponsor of that law. She's interested in maybe revisiting that to maybe add back some exceptions and and things like that. My question is, do you see any appetite in the legislature in a post row world of revisiting that Alabama's laws as it pertains to abortion? Well, I would say the issue of abortion has been a very important topic to the legislature, in my opinion, during my tenure of service. Um, I can tell you I had on this topic, I had some notes that, that, that I went through just today. Um, one of the things that was most important to me, I'd say one of the highlights of my legislative service was back in 2012, you'll remember the Affordable Care Act was on everyone's mind. Mm -hmm. And they offered the opportunity through the Affordable Care Act for states to be able to have federal funds to offer state-sponsored abortions. And I sponsored a bill in 2012, it was Senate Bill 10, that basically said we in Alabama don't want those funds. We do not want to use federal money to sponsor abortions in our state. I think Alabama was one of only 17 states that refused those resources. And um, I'm certainly proud of that legislation. That has been my attitude related to the abortion and the sanctity of life theme throughout the entirety of my service, all the way to the 2019 legislation, uh, which was very controversial, as you mentioned, um, but was one of maybe the strongest law in the nation. And I think the Alabama legislature and the governor were very definitive on where we wanted that position to be. Now, as is often the case, you look at legislation, you pass it in specific reasons, specific ways. If it needs to be changed and modified, that's something that the legislature will have to look at. We do that related to what we think best in legislative themes all the time. Uh, in this issue, I think you've got some challenge in, in examining exactly how you would do that because this was a constitutional amendment. So the people of Alabama have voted that this is where they feel like this should be. If the legislature looks to modify or change that, then there will be some legal questions to is there a way to do it? Can you do it? And if you decide that that's what you want to do, then does it go back to the people for their decision and the like? So mm -hmm. I think what we need to look at as far as time frame here, number one, what happens with Roe v. Wade? Alabama and our legislature, we've already done the hard work of standing up for the unborn, uh, focusing on sanctity of life, which is what was most important. We've already done that in our law. Now, what happens with Roe v. Wade, Roe v. Wade and the Supreme Court? And then if that comes back to us for more decision, we already know our laws will go into effect. Um, do they need to be modified? Is there some question about it? I think that'll be a decision that the legislature will have to make. Uh, but at the moment, there's a lot to be reviewed and a lot to be done before we ever get to that place. Mm -hmm. um, while I've got you real quick, we've, we're in the middle, we're about to have a primary election just in a couple of days. Um, you, you've got a lot of senators up for re-election right now and some open seats. How's the primaries looking? Well, you're right. We're in election season, man. It's, uh, it's hot as a firecracker. And, uh, but things are positive. You know, if I look at the Alabama Senate, we've got 35 members in the Senate. We have five open seats, two Democrat, three Republican. Of the 27 Republican seats that we have, 24 of those are running for re-election. And of those, seven have primary opponents. So we're focused on those seven primary opponents hoping that our incumbents are going to be successful. And uh, you've got some very aggressive races going on. We've been um, um, working on that process. The candidates um, across the board have all been working hard. And um, there's been about $3 million thus far spent in the uh, primary races that I'm aware of. So it's been robust. We'll see what the outcomes are. I feel good about our incumbents. I think they've run good races. I think many of the accomplishments that the people of Alabama recognize have been ours for them, for their benefit, uh, have paid dividends during their election cycle. And it seems like the things are positive. So we'll see how it turns out. We're excited about it. We will see on election day. Well, Senator, thanks again for coming on the show. Thank you, Todd. We'll be right back. You're watching Alabama Public Television. Next, I'm joined by Secretary of State John Merrill. 
Mr. Secretary, thanks for coming on Capitol Journal. Todd, great to be with you again. You're a, a busy man these days with the election just days away, so I appreciate you making the time. What do our viewers need to know with the election just, again, a few days away about getting out to vote on this election day? Well, of course, last night was the last time to turn in your absentee ballot in person. And then Monday is the last time to actually visit the office and turn it in if you made that application by Thursday. So we want our viewers to know that they need to be prepared to vote in person at their polling site on Tuesday the 24th from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And they need to be informed about the candidates and their positions so that they can cast an educated vote. What do you expect turnout to look like on Tuesday? We anticipate that we're going to have between 28 and 32 percent of our 3,640,606 registered voters go to the polls. That's going to be between about 1.2 and 1.25 million people participating in the Democrat and Republican primaries combined. How does that compare to recent elections? It's a little higher than we've seen in the midterm elections, mm -hmm. but that's an expectation because we've had a lot of money that's been spent by a lot of candidates trying to get the two top offices that are on the ballot this time, of course, with the governor's race and the U.S. Senate seat that's open. You're right about that. There has been a lot of money. Of course, we report on a lot of this stuff, and I think you know, in the Senate race alone, I think $25, $26 million dollars. The governor's race, at least 10 that we can account for. And your office tracks all this. You know, when you go online to figure out how much campaigns are spent, that's your office's involvement. So I guess y'all have been busy in that regard. No doubt about it, Todd, because not only are we keeping up with those expenses and the income, but also penalties that have to be levied in those races, as well as races all the way down to the county commission and school board level. Let me ask you about the new reporting system. Uh, I know you said that every county is going to be on the same system this time in terms of reporting the election results. What do we need to know about that? Well, Todd, they have been before, but the thing to note that's different this time is that because of some of the concerns that have been introduced nationally, and we've never had a vulnerability exposed in Alabama, but we want to make sure that each one of our 68 probate judges in the 67 counties are actually using a secured hard drive that will transmit the data to us that has never been used for any other purpose except for election night reporting. So we spent 247,000 taxpayer dollars to make sure that those purchases were made and that those computers are placed in the 67 counties in the 68 jurisdictions. So there's no excuse not to use a secured technical expert piece of equipment for that purpose. Um, do you expect that to speed up, slow down, affect the time of the reporting you, at all? You know, Todd, there's been some conversation that there may be some delays in Jefferson County. Uh, I hope Jefferson County is able to report their returns at the same rate they've been able to before. They have two computers, one in Bessemer at the cutoff, the other one downtown at Richard Arrington where the courthouse is, and they're the only county that has two. Uh, Madison County has one, Mobile County has one, Montgomery County has one. Those are the highest population counties besides Jefferson. And if you split Jefferson in half and see where the numbers are, it's basically the same size as those other three. So we anticipate that it's going to be basically the same amount of time that we've usually seen. But the most important thing to remember, Todd, it's not to be fast, it's to be accurate. In spite of the fact that this is for election night reporting with unofficial numbers. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you about some of these outside groups that have been playing in this election. Your office has been, you know, getting out the word about, you know, to be wary of some of these groups who are electioneering. They're trying to, you know, affect the vote, but maybe not registering correctly or following the rules. That's correct. And when they're not following established state and or federal guidelines, it's incumbent on us to notify the people of the state that that activity is taking place and to help them evaluate the information they're receiving from those groups so they'll know whether or not it's accurate, whether or not it's transparent, and whether or not those people are being genuine in their presentation. And we're finding that some of those people are not. Well, let me ask you th about that because, you know, I remember this from four years ago. Really, it, it happens a lot. Uh, I remember in, in particular, I think it was the attorney general's race where, yeah, you had a group come in, not registered at all, you know, not reporting their um, expenditures and their uh, contributions and really uh, trying to impact that race. It got reported. 
um, but I never saw a penalty or anything like that. Do you expect penalties in this case? Well, Todd, look, the thing that you have to remember when you're evaluating what is ongoing is whether or not it breaks established state and or federal laws. And if it does, we're going to identify those people. We're going to investigate them. If it's warranted, we're going to indict them and prosecute them to the fullest extent of the law. If it comes to assigning penalties that have to be paid, we're going to do that as well. But if they're not actually breaking the law the way that the law is written, the law has to be tightened up. And that's what we've done over the past few years in certain ones of these areas. But it also needs to be remembered that sometimes people spend an inordinate amount of time, money, and resources trying to find a way to circumvent those laws. Yeah. And I know you're aware of that, but that's where we are. <laughs> yeah, that's well, that's a great point because do you think, or maybe we'll tell after this election, um, do you think the laws need to be tightened up, those loopholes closed and things like that? Because that, as both a voter and a, a media personality, it's frustrating that somebody can break the rules and influence the vote. Um, for, because, you know, voters are out there, they don't know the difference between the, this information and, and, and maybe more legitimate information. Todd, very disappointing when that occurs. But that's why the legislature's work is never done, even in the area of election integrity, because things are always changing. So you want to make sure that you are paying attention to all the things that are ongoing and then make good decisions about what areas need to have attention given for the next election cycle. Well, speaking of this election, there are uh, se several candidates, I guess, yeah, several candidates running to be Secretary of State. Right. They want to, they aspire to your job. So I wondered if you might have any advice for those candidates who are, are running for Secretary of State. Well, the thing that they have to remember is the job is a job the way that it's described in the code and the Constitution, but then there are certain things that you have to give attention to in order to be an effective public servant. So number one, I would encourage them to listen to the people of Alabama. Number two, I would encourage them to make sure that they're working well with members of the Alabama legislature. Number three, they need a good relationship with the probate judges, the circuit clerks, the sheriffs, and the registrars in all 67 counties. And if they begin to manage that part of the operation, then working with the team members that are currently members of the Secretary of State's office should be relatively easy for them and they could be effective public servants. So we're gonna have this election on Tuesday. Um, I mean, it's almost certain we're going to have runoffs and that'll occur four weeks from now or four weeks from then. That's a that's a change. It used to be six weeks. That is it? correct. So and does that put more pressure on you and your election officials? Not really, Todd. Uh, what we did was we evaluated where we were back after the 2018 cycle and realized that there is not a reason anymore for us to have a two additional week delay between the primary and the runoff. So the legislature passed a bill for us in 2019 that changed our runoff period from six weeks back to four weeks where it had been for many, many years. And in doing so, it enabled us to shorten the length of time that people have to listen to those advertisements, <laughs> shorten the length of time where campaigns have to give attention to trying to get votes, and shorten the length of time that we have to make sure we're properly prepared. But once those things happen, and once we have those candidates' names confirmed after the election's been certified, we have the ballots printed and sent out and the process takes care of itself if everybody follows the steps they're supposed to in election administration. Well, election will be here before we know it. Mr. Merrill, thanks for coming on Capital Journal and good luck on election day. Thanks, Todd. It's always good to be with you. We'll be right back. You can watch past episodes of Capital Journal online anytime at Alabama Public Television's website, aptv.org. Click on the online video tab on the main page. You can also connect with Capital Journal and link to past episodes on Capital Journal's Facebook page. Next, I'm joined by Dr. Scott Harris, Public Health Officer for the state of Alabama. Doc, thanks for coming on Capital Journal. Thanks for having me, Todd. Uh, this, this is the first time we've had you on since you yourself had a bout with COVID. Yeah, I that's trust, right. I trust you're fully recovered. Yeah, yeah, I'm doing fine. Uh, you know, we, uh, my wife and I actually were gonna go visit my parents uh, around the Easter weekend. They're, they're, my parents are in their 80s and, and I had a, you know, a little runny nose or something like that. So I thought, well, why don't we test? And we were kind of surprised to find that we both uh, were positive. We actually had been 
uh, vaccinated and boosted and received a second booster as well a couple of weeks before that. And so uh, our illness was, was real mild. It, you know, I stayed at home and worked, got to work in my pajamas, which was nice, but, <laughs> but still worked. Uh, and, and so it really does just go to prove the point, you know, the vaccination and boosting really does keep you from getting sick, even if it doesn't always keep you from getting infected. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about the state of COVID. I was actually surprised to learn this week that a biscuits game got canceled because of a small outbreak. So, I mean, it must be still present in the community and spreading some. Yeah, we, we are seeing numbers that are starting to go up. In, in uh, Alabama, over the past two weeks, cases have increased about 80%. That's, you know, a big percentage increase, but it's still a pretty low number because cases had gotten down so low. So we have had for a couple of months, you know, two, you know 200, 250 cases a day uh, compared to, you know, 17,000 back in uh, January uh, on some days. Um, but now we're seeing case numbers more like 400 a day or, you know, 450 a day. So numbers are definitely going up. Um, but they're, you know, a number we can handle. There's not large numbers of people in the hospital right now. Um, but, you know, we we still have some concern. We're not a really well vaccinated state. If we get another variant um, that, you know, spreads easily, we're, you know, not sure what's gonna happen. Are we to the point yet in this pandemic or where, where it becomes endemic, meaning it's just kind of always going to be present variant after variant, year after year, almost seasonally? I, I think it's always gonna be here. You know, there, there's some kind of specific definitions for whether it's endemic or not. And, and, you know, there are endemic diseases in the world like, you know, malaria that kill hundreds of thousands of kids every year, you know, so, so endemic doesn't necessarily mean it's good or mild. It just means you're never gonna get rid of it. Yeah. Uh, but, but endemic also implies that it's kind of predictable and that you have some sense of what your numbers are gonna be and so on. Um, so I, I think we're going to get to an endemic state for sure, but right now I think it's a little early to say because we still, you know, have a risk for surges again. Uh, you know, we, we had so many Alabamians who got infected in December and January, uh, you know, most of the state probably, or, you know, maybe half the state or more, that those people probably have some protection on board or did for a few months. And so, you know, when we started seeing numbers going up in the Northeast, it, it hadn't really happened here. But that natural immunity uh, is gonna wane. Uh, we know that it does. And so, uh, you know, later in the summer or, or in the fall, I think, you know, with our vaccination rates, I think we just don't know what's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. Well, the, part of the reason why I ask is, I remember back to the beginning of the pandemic, I mean, two years ago, and there was this hope that, okay, if we just do these protective measures and do things, we can really beat this virus and, and be done with it. But it just seems like, you know, new variants emerge and, and year after year, this might just keep happening. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the virus is smarter than we are. <laughs> and so, you know, uh, what, it, it continues to mutate, to mutate and to, you know, evolve, to escape the therapeutics we're throwing at it, to escape the vaccines that we're trying to throw at it. Fortunately, the disease hasn't gotten worse in terms of severity for the most part, at least since Delta. It's gotten a little uh, milder on average, uh, but that you know still poses a lot of risk for people who are vulnerable, like seniors or people with chronic health problems. What is the latest with vaccines and and boosters, so that people know? Um, so, so the numbers in Alabama, you know, still remain you know fairly low. We we, we don't have uh, really much interest in vaccines or boosters right now. Um, about half the state's fully vaccinated, and and you know a lot of those people have been boosted as well. Um, it seems like um, that you know after five or six months, people are going to need additional boosters. You know, we we don't formally recommend that for every age group, uh, but certainly for people over 50 or people that have chronic health problems, we are recommending a, a second booster dose if it's been at least five months. Um, there's plenty of vaccine available. Um, you can get it anytime in any county in multiple locations probably. And so I would encourage people to use this sort of downtime when we're not having our hospitals overrun as a time to go out and make sure that you're protected. Well, yeah, actually I was trying to get a booster the other day, but went through the website and everything and said, oh, I wasn't eligible. I guess I wasn't old enough. Um, are, What's the schedule for that now? Yeah, so so right now the the recommendation is that um, w once you've completed your initial series and then had a booster, um, you can you're eligible for a second booster if you're age 50 and older, um, or uh, actually anyone age 12 and up if you have certain underlying chronic health problems. Uh, okay. And so uh, th those are the groups that are most at risk for serious outcomes. I, I think it'll be. Um, fairly soon that the second booster or additional boosters will be available for everyone, but it's just not technically there yet. Switching gears real quick, um, there was 
really frightening news about this uh, outbreak of pediatric hepatitis that really started in Alabama. What can you tell us about what happened? Yeah, that, that's interesting. It's still a very rare occurrence, but it's been uh, discovered now in about 36 states and in several countries around the world, particularly in Western Europe. Um, the, the reason uh, that it was found in Alabama, it's not clear that it actually started here, but it was first identified in Alabama uh, by some physicians at the Children's Hospital uh, in Birmingham. You know. A children's Hospital is one of the best virology centers in the country, actually. We're very fortunate to have Children's Hospital here in our state. And so there were four children um, last September and October that were referred to that hospital with unexplained liver disease. And it's possible that it's linked to a certain type of virus called, called adenovirus. It's not, not for certain that it is. Uh, but it may be. Uh, some of those kids actually required liver transplants. Um, uh, around the country, there have been about five or six deaths in uh, these kids who are mostly under age five, uh, no deaths in Alabama. Uh, but uh, it is an unusual thing that we're continuing to investigate. I think uh, at last count now, we have about 12 kids that we've identified in the state total since last September. Uh, so, so certainly not a large outbreak. Uh, but it's just not clear what's going on. They come from different parts of the state. They're, it's not related, I can, we know for sure, to COVID infection or to COVID vaccination. These kids are too young even to be vaccinated. Uh, that question gets asked a lot, as you might imagine. Um, but uh, it's not clear what, what has led this to happen now, but it is something that we're tracking very closely. And also, I wanted to ask you about baby formula. Obviously, it's huge news nationally that there's this shortage because of that you know factory that got shut down i think it's coming back online um but is that is that shortage affecting alabama yet um it, it is somewhat there, there are certainly people that are having trouble finding the product they're used to finding i i, I don't uh, I think most people are unable to find anything. I think there is additional product out there, and the best advice is to talk to your, you know, pediatrician or healthcare provider about what's right for your child. Um, in, in Alabama, um, our women's infants and children's program that provides nutrition for low-income people uh, has a contract with uh, Mead Johnson, which is not the uh, factory that shut down. That was an Abbott factory. Some states are actually Abbott states, and, and others are, you know, with others like other companies like Alabama. Those states that contract with Abbott really are seeing big shortages in their WIC programs as well. Um, but we're not seeing that in our WIC program. But also, you know, most uh, uh, people who are buying formula aren't in our WIC program. They're, you know, people who are out in, in the private world trying to track down formula. So the most important thing to do is, is talk to your pediatrician or healthcare provider. Please don't try to make your own formula. Please don't water down formula that you have to make it last longer. Uh, please don't buy, buy things on the black market if you don't know where they're coming from. Uh, just talk to your doctor and try to figure out the best way to take care of your baby. It's these little things that you know become huge things uh, suddenly when, when we run out of them. It, it's amazing, isn't it? You know, we see, you know, two years ago it was all about toilet paper and that seemed like a crisis. But, you know, this, this you know, baby formula, that's a really serious issue. And uh, we, we understand from the feds that, that it ought to be easing in the next few days. It's probably still going to be a couple of months to have things back to normal. Well, thank you for your advice uh, to parents and for all that you're sharing uh, with us today on Capital Journal. Thanks for having me, Todd. We'll be right back. You can watch past episodes of Capital Journal online at video.aptv.org. Capital Journal episodes are also available on APTV's free mobile app. You can also connect with Capital Journal and link to past episodes on Capital Journal's Facebook page. And you can listen to past episodes of Capital Journal when you're driving or on the go with Capital Journal Podcasts. Next, I'm joined by David Mowry, chairman of the Mowry Consulting Group. Dave, thanks for coming on the show. Hey, man. Thanks for having me. This is great. I wanted to have you on. Uh, you are a well-known political consultant here in the state. We're obviously just days away <laughs> from this election. Um, and there are lots of races on the ballot statewide that I hope you could provide some analysis on, uh, given your experience. And you've worked in Democratic campaigns. You've worked in Republican campaigns. You, you're really well-suited to... Uh, to speak to some of these races, I think. Um, let's start with the, the bottom of the ballot, down ballot, <laughs> if you will. We have some races that, you know, they, these offices don't get a whole lot of attention, starting with state auditor. We have Stan Cook, a, a minister, Rusty Glover, a former state senator, and Andrew Sorrell, a current state representative. Does anybody have an advantage here? Yeah, you know, I think it's interesting because Sorrell, I think, has been in the race for a long time, and he's sort of an up-and-comer type. Um, 
But then you got Glover, who ran four years ago, who has experience in a statewide race, who has friends statewide, who has a base in Mobile. And I think that, you know, that's the dynamic to watch is uh, who among them kind of gets their people out and how they do in the rest of the places and then just how much, you know, the other guy. I think those are the only two that are advertising. And so, you know, but you have to figure it'll probably go to a runoff. Mm-hmm. I, would th- I don't think either of them has a decided advantage. And frankly, I can't tell you who would win a runoff between the two. And there's no Democrat running for auditor, so whoever wins that, who wins that primary, wins it all. Uh, for Secretary of State, this is an important office. Uh, we have Wes Allen, a state representative, Christian Horn, a Republican leader from North Alabama, Ed Packard, who has worked in the Secretary of State's office as an employee for many years, and Jim Ziegler, who is, of course, the current state auditor. Um, I guess, do you see a runoff happening here, too? Yeah, I think so. Um, it's interesting because if you're in Montgomery, you, I see Ed Packard billboards everywhere, but I don't really see anything from anything else. Uh, Wes Allen, again, got in early, has raised the most money. Uh, but Ziegler is sort of uh, old hat at that. He's he's used to this and sort of uh, he probably feels like he's in the catbird seat. I don't know who will lead. But then the problem is, is when you get down to a runoff, does is Allen able to just swamp him with money? Mm hmm. Um, and that winner would go on to face Democrat Pamela Lafitte, uh, who is unchallenged in her primary. Hmm. Um, Supreme Court, an interesting race developing here between Republicans Greg Cook and Deborah Jones. Uh, no runoff here, just two candidates, so winner takes all. Yeah, that's kind of the rarity, right, is just the fact that, that, that it's only those two candidates, and they appear to be both pretty well-funded, both pretty, you know, up on TV, kind of making their argument. Uh, I think that there's sort of a proxy war between some of the uh, constituencies that uh, that deal with the courts uh, on that one. I don't have a feel for it. Um, I think that uh, they really try to get, you know, Deborah Jones wasn't there. Didn't we have a Deborah that ran before? It's like, mm-hmm. you know, maybe with the name thing. Uh, Cook seems to be pretty well respected, um, has done a good job raising money. And really, I think that that's just kind of a jump ball. Um, yeah. Well, it, you're right. It is kind of turning into a proxy war between the tradi- – it reminds me of the old 90s tort yeah, wars. You know, exactly. Trial lawyers versus the business community. Um, and all – it seems like all the advertising, all the money has really kind of come in here at the last minute. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so in, in the polling we did some time back – or really it was two weeks ago um, – Greg Cook had a slight advantage, but it wasn't. It's, it was a right. lot of undecideds. Yeah, and I mean, I think that those are one of those. Those, those are those races that are sort of um, low information. Uh, people kind of go by feel for how they want a judge to be or who they want a judge to be. Um, and if you look at a lot of our Supreme Court, you might think that that Cook has an advantage. But then you got to look at where their uh, where their bases of uh, where, where the bases of support are. Um, and really, you know, I. That's one I just I'd, I'd flip a coin. Mm-hmm. I would I would not be surprised either way though. And that winner will face Democrat Anita Kelly, who is also unchallenged. A lot of these on the Democratic side, they're running only one candidate in some of these races. Right. Um, and speaking of that, moving on to the governor's race on the Democratic side, a really crowded field. Um, and these aren't necessarily household names: Yolanda Flowers, Patricia Jamison, Arthur Kelly, Chad Chig Martin. Malika Sanders Fortier, Doug Newblue Smith. Um, that's the ballot. I haven't seen much campaign advertising uh, for the Democratic candidates. I haven't seen any. Um, as a matter of fact, I didn't even know that uh, Senator Sanders Fortier was running until like two or three weeks ago. Well, I think and she was a, a the, the day of qualifying. Just oh, kind of, okay. Kind of because it was the day of qualifying, and then her dad. Right. Ran for her, her seat, it was all kind of weird. Well, I knew that she had had some kind of uh, health issues or were just out mm-hmm. because of COVID, you mm-hmm. know, just didn't come or whatever. And I thought that I thought that, that meant she was, you know, giving up her Senate seat and just, you know, taking it to the House or whatever, or going to be a lawyer. And uh, that's, it, that's an interesting one. I don't have a feel for it. I do think that, you know, I, I do think that she probably has an advantage with given the constituency that votes in the Democratic primary. Yeah. Okay. Um, the Republican side, Governor Kay Ivey is vying for re-election, but facing some competition. A crowded field here too. Uh, Tim James, Lindy Blanchard, those are the real, those are the ones that have been on TV the most. Lou Burdett also, um, but also running are Stacy Lee George, uh, Dean Young, Dave Thomas, and Dean Odell. The contest here is about 
the runoff, right? Yeah, or or, or if there's going to be one, right? Right. Um, if if Governor Ivy can sort of consolidate her support, you know, we saw the poll, I guess, last week or maybe early this week that you did, mm-hmm. uh, that said that basically she's very popular, but not above that magic fifty percent mark. Um, you know, the thing that gets down to it in the last days of the campaign, though, is are people going to go in and they're going to say that they want something different? Or are they going to say that with all this stuff that's gone crazy in the past, you know, four years, has Ivy been a steady hand at the at the till? And, you know, I, and I, frankly, I don't know, because when people spent like $20 million telling the whole state, you know, how terrible you are, maybe enough of them believe it to get into a runoff. And then it's who's in the runoff. Sure. Because one of the things to think about when you, when you talk about taking on an incumbent, you have to get them to fire the incumbent and then hire you. And so sometimes, you know, the, it might be like the, the dog that catches the car, right? They get in the runoff and then the governor's people just train their guns on that one person. And, you know, probably not super pleasant to be that one person. Well, th- that's right, because unlike the Senate race, the in the governor's race, like take, take Tim James and Lindy Blanchard. Um, they've not had any attacks directed at them. Right. It's all been directed at Ivy. So right. suddenly, if there is a runoff, you got to think Ivy's going to shoot back. Yeah, and I would guess that they have pretty thick oppo books on yeah. everybody. Right. Well, that's interesting to watch. And, and the big Senate race, this is the big one. Huge. First on the Democratic side, we have Will Boyd, Brandon Dean, and Lanny Jackson. Uh, Will Boyd, of course, ran for lieutenant governor uh, two year, uh, two, uh, four years ago. Um, what do you see here? You know, who knows? I think it probably has to do with who votes in the Democratic primary, how many people vote, sort of how much they get, you know, the ADC ballots out and things like that. And Mm -hmm. if anybody got that endorsement Um, and, you know, is anybody sort of trying to, like, get in a lane with uh, with any of the governor's candidates? You know, and Mm -hmm. I I, I haven't seen a single ad for any of those people. Yeah. Which is interesting. Well, again, and and sometimes on the Democratic side, those getting on those sample ballots, those lists is Is like really the the, the ticket. Uh, and the big one, the Republican race for Senate. Katie Britt, Mo Brooks, Mike Durant in a tight race there. Also on the ballot are Lily, Bo- Lily Bodie, Carla DePriest, and Jake Schaefer. This one seems destined for a runoff. Yeah, I think so. I, I think that uh, sort of each candidate has a base of support. Each candidate has sort of a lane that they are in or that they've sort of been put in, uh, especially, you know, Mo Brooks thought he was in one lane. Now he's in another lane. But I will tell you the interesting thing is, is that from people that I've talked to, they say that it's anybody's guess as to the order and sort of anybody's guess as to like who, uh, you know, who, who is the second candidate. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think that uh, Britt has a lot of advantages. Durant has a lot of advantages. But Mo sort of fl- everybody thought he flamed out when the Trump thing went away. But then everybody stopped training their guns on him. And so it's like, does he, you know, with, with Durant, we've seen this so many times, with Durant and Britt hitting each other, hitting each other, hitting each other, does Brooks rise? I don't know. I don't have a feel for it. I think that the two of them splitting a base, uh, the two of them being uh, Mo Brooks and Mike Durant of North Alabama, mm-hmm. and frankly of older white males, um, is, you know, is an interesting thing to look for. And does Britt bring out a different looking electorate? Does she bring out more women more younger people who in Alabama, those are two constituencies. Everywhere else, that's a swing vote. Alabama, those people are solidly Republican. Can she get enough of the folks that don't normally vote in a Republican primary, but would vote for her for anything hmm. to come out? That's a dynamic that I'm watching. So assuming it goes to a runoff, the other big, uh, big question is, does former President Donald Trump get involved with, right. with an endorsement? Right. Um, and I think it probably has to do with who is in the race, you know, and then it's like, is he, um, is he going for somebody or is he going against somebody? Right. Funny thing about President Trump is, is that him being for you certainly helps. If you look at last night, uh, we're recording this on a mm-hmm. Wednesday. And so, uh, you look at North Carolina, you look at Pennsylvania, the Trump candidates tended to win in those places and they still tend to win unless something weird or there's a dynamic locally that people don't really catch on to. Um, which I think he figured out was going to happen with the Brooks thing, which is why he jumped off it. But what I'm getting to here is, is that sometimes it's a lot more fun, especially for us girls, to uh, watch him turn his uh, rapier wit 
on you know on somebody and really take them down a peg that's what i'm looking forward to yeah well, that's interesting no matter who he endorses <laughs> well sure and and you know like i said mo brooks he, he de-endorsed but also had some real harsh criticism for him so it'd, it'd be kind of hard to see him yeah like well re- re-endorsing him or something. no it almost seems to me that if it's a brit and durant runoff that he might stay out of it completely and decide he can live with either of them mm-hmm. because putting your thumb on the scale for one is probably picking a winner but you got to make sure that you're with the right person. Sure. Um, but then if it's Durant and Brooks or Britt and Brooks, I think that uh, you're going to see, uh, you're going to hear the president's voice a lot more. Because he wants to win. And uh, right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, lots of fascinating races. I really appreciate you coming on the show and Always sharing your expertise. Yeah, I, I, I really appreciate you having me. All right. It's great. We'll be right back. Created by the U.S. Congress on May 18, 1933, the Tennessee Valley Authority, or TVA, is the nation's largest public power company and a world-renowned regional development agency. It operates hydroelectric dams and coal-fired and nuclear power plants in northern Alabama and other southern states. TVA also manages the Tennessee River for flood control, navigation, recreation, and water quality. That's our show for tonight. Thanks for watching. We'll be back next week, Friday night at 7.30, right here on Alabama Public Television. For our Capital Journal team, I'm Todd Stacy. We'll see you next time. <laughs>